morning. When I was planning this talk, I decided not to have a PowerPoint slideshow, that the world was already sick of PowerPoint slideshows, and that my talk would be an opportunity to use old-fashioned note cards. And now I think that may have been a mistake. So, woo! <laughs> I also had an opportunity to wear my bright green pants and my suspenders, and I did not take that. <laughs> the narrative arc of this talk can be delivered in one sentence, not including this one. And that is that I was a regular classroom teacher, and a poem that I wrote 15 years ago about a lawyer insulting me and the entire teaching profession at a party indirectly led to a 1,000 people changing their jobs, a 1,001 if you include me. And the poem was called What Teachers Make, and I'm not going to do it here. And it was essentially what I wish I had been smart enough to say to the lawyer at the party when he insulted me. See, he had this theory that anyone who would willingly become a teacher, knowing how poorly compensated teachers are, must have something wrong with them and shouldn't be allowed to become a teacher in the first place. And the poem is very much in the tradition of the poetry slam that started in Chicago. And at the end of it, it, it ends with me declaiming, you want to know what I make. Teachers make a goddamn difference. Now what about you? <clears throat> and then I walk off stage. Yeah, right, right, OK. Just pretend I did the whole poem. Now, this rapid fire session is supposed to be about identifying opportunities, so I should probably start out by saying that the first opportunity I identified was the opportunity to make myself feel better by writing a poem, but also to revise the memory of that night and sort of cast myself in a better light. Because I don't mention this in the poem, but the lawyer who said that, come on, Taylor, be honest, what do you make as a teacher? He was six foot five. He was disarmingly attractive, uh, <laughs> very confident, a little bit drunk, and he was also the host of the party. So I didn't really want to make too much trouble. So when he looked at me and asked me what I made, I looked him in his face and I said, you want to know what I make? $28,500. <laughs> but I was angry with him. And so for the rest of the night, uh, I just stewed in my anger. And uh, the next day, I started writing the poem, What Teachers Make, as a kind of a wish fulfillment. So I have another poem of mine called Ars Poetica, in which I define poetry as the art that allows you to rewrite history and make yourself sound smarter than you actually are, recast the night sky of your own life, and constellate yourself as a star. And that's exactly what I did with the poem, What Teachers Make. The French have a saying to describe those witty comebacks that occur to you as you are walking down the staircase, and that is esprit d'escalier, the wit of the staircase. And in a very real sense, what teachers make is an example of uh, what could be called poésie d'escalier. And in another sense, to speak as a biffnik, which I am soon to start calling myself, uh, it was a way to celebrate my mistakes. Right? I didn't publish po uh, What Teachers Make until my first book of poetry came out a few years later. But I did immediately identify the opportunity to post the poem on my brand new worldwide website, which had lots of poems with pages that said, coming soon, or under construction. <laughs> and very soon, I started getting emails about the poem. People started telling me that they were changing their majors to education because of my poetry, because of the way I spoke about teaching. Or else that they said they were going back to school to finish their degree. Or maybe they were just going to start teaching piano lessons after school. And this made me feel amazing. It made me feel like I was uh, speaking to a community. People told me that I had given them a voice, something to say when other people ask them, why did you become a teacher when you knew that you weren't going to make a whole lot? Uh, one of my favorite definitions of poetry is what oft was thought, but never so well expressed. I felt It made me feel like a poet. I don't know for sure that it was my friend Noel Jones who was the first one to tell me that 
She had decided to become a teacher based in part because of the passion with which I spoke about the profession. But I had to start somewhere, so I now consider Noel Jones to be teacher number one. In the beginning, when someone told me that they had decided to become a teacher based on my work, I would say, gee, thanks. I think that makes you like the 10th person to tell me that. And it was a journalist who helped me identify the next opportunity. He said, wait, 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 wait. 10 people have decided to become teachers just because of your poetry? That's huge. That's a huge accomplishment. And my response was, OK, yeah, you're right. I'll start keeping better track then. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 you're missing the point. What I really needed in order to make it a compelling story was a goal, a deadline, and the risk of failure. To a journalist, it's not a compelling story unless there's conflict, unless there's tension, which is true about a poem, too, or any work of literature. So I gave myself a goal of convincing a 1,000 people to become teachers through poetry, persuasion, and perseverance. And I called it my quest for a 1,000 teachers. Actually, I called it the New Teacher Project. But little did I know, <laughs> Michelle Rhee had already started something called the New Teacher Project a few years before that. And she had the executive director call me a few years ago and said, our lawyers want to write you a cease and desist letter, but we're all fans of yours, including Michelle, so we just want to know if you could come up with a different name. So it was called the Quest for a Thousand Teachers. As, as uh, Chris said, you have to move with your mission, and so I did. And I started. And I also improved my record keeping many times. I moved with my mission. How I kept track of the people who credited me with their decision to teach changed as the years went by. First, it was an email-based system. But then when the blogging platform LiveJournal came out, I used to write an entry every time someone told me that they decided to become a teacher because of me. I found that if I talked about my progress, I made more progress. Call it the law of attraction. Spending energy talking about something that you're, will attract more uh, attention to it. Soon I created a blog entirely devoted to the folks who credited me in part with their decision to teach. But even that was too laborious. See, I would ask people to send me their first and last name, their hometown, an eloquent description of how my work as a poet had influenced their decision to teach, uh, plus a couple of other personal details that would never get posted on the web, but I would just have. And invariably, they would forget one or two things, or the picture that they posted of themselves was either too big or too small. And my heart used to sink every time I got an email that said, count me on your list. And your heart should never sink when you get an email from someone who is attempting to help you with your goal. So I identified an opportunity to ask for help from Craigslist. <laughs> and it came to me in the form of a computer engineer named Jorge Castaneda, who built for me a very simple online web form so the teachers could fill in all the information. And if they didn't do it perfectly, if the picture was the wrong format, or if they uh, did left out a, a field, it would just spit it back. And then it would only accept their form when they had done everything perfectly. And I would get an email saying, there is a new teacher to approve or reject. <laughs> because I did have to reject some. I read so many descriptions from teachers about how my work had influenced their decision to teach that I could tell in the first sentence whether or not they were going to make it on the list. If they had said, I never really knew what I wanted to do, yeah, they're going to probably make it. If they had said, I always thought that I hated poetry, yep, you're going to make it. But if it started out with, I actually knew from the age of five, long before I ever heard of you, that nope, you're not going to make it. Or if somebody said, I was probably teaching before you were born, they were also not going to make it. Because I wanted my list to be just of people who had decided to become teachers after they heard of me. If you were a veteran teacher, no. If you were one of those kids who knew from the age of five when you lined up every stuffed animal in the house and stood in front of the painting easel 
with your brother's magic wand from his magic kit and taught math to the stuffed animals, I love you, but you're not on this list. I used to tell those people I had a, another list, an unofficial list of people who I had helped not quit. <laughs> and, uh, and they were on it. Now, all of this makes it sound like the list was much more official than it really was. I had my own standards and my own guidelines, but they were fluid, and they depended on my mood. <laughs> and they also changed as I got closer to my deadline. Early on, if somebody wrote to me and said, because of you, I changed my education to major. Woo! <laughs> I changed my major to education. <laughs> and thanks to you, in six weeks, I will be a real teacher with my own classroom. I would write to that person and say, well, you write me back in six weeks. <laughs> but later, as the scope of my undertaking dawned on me and I realized I needed to have more help, I started accepting anyone who could eloquently describe their conversion into a teacher, their blossoming into a teacher, even if it was just an after-school karate teacher, or maybe you leave out the part about you only being 16. <laughs> and of course, I have no way of telling whether the people who told me they had become, were going to become teachers actually did, or how long they stayed in the profession. Sure, I have email addresses and phone numbers for most of them, especially the last 500. But unless a journalist wants to interview one or two of them in the process of writing a story, I don't really have that many opportunities to reach out to them. There are only two more main points to this talk. And the first is that I did not meet my first deadline, which was 2006, at which point I barely had 100 teachers on my list. Or the next deadline, which was 2010. But I kept going because I liked having a goal, even without the deadline. If I didn't finish until I was 75, so be it, I thought. In the end, it took me twice as long to reach my goal as I thought it would. Uh, I eventually finished on April 7, 2012, at the book release party for What Teachers Make in Praise of the Greatest Job in the World which was at the Bowery Poetry Club in New York City. I approved the 1,000th teacher on my list, a young woman named Mary Ann Emberton, the youngest of 10 children in Tennessee, now a teacher herself, the only one to go to college. We Skyped with her live at the Bowery Poetry Club. The whole audience cheered her. And then my best friend, Kristen O'Keefe Aptowitz, cut off 12 inches of my hair, and I donated it to the American Cancer Society. And I guess that's another opportunity identified. I identified the chance to rid myself of my Fabio hair <laughs> that I had been trailing behind me for years and to contribute to a worthy cause. And the second and final main point is this. A funny thing happened on the way to inspiring a 1,000 people to become teachers. And that is that I was changed. And I was inspired more than anyone else. My quest for a 1,000 teachers shifted from something I was tracking on the side as I lived my life as a poet to a goal that was larger than myself. Essentially, it was the reason why I became a poet in the first place. As Chris might have said, my quest became the lens through which I viewed the world. When I started my quest, I was not entirely clear of the scope of the opportunity that I was seizing. It felt like I was seizing a door without necessarily knowing what was on the other side. Or I was laying claim to a ladder without having a specific tree in mind that I wanted to climb. When people ask me why I stopped teaching, I used to say that I had an opportunity to follow my dream and make a living as a professional poet. But Horace said that the task of the poet is to either delight or instruct, and that we must reserve our greatest approbation for those who can do both at the same time. And insofar as that is also the task of a teacher, I have actually never stopped teaching. And in conclusion, as long as I'm giving a talk 
during this rapid fire session about identifying opportunities. I should probably mention that I had a great working relationship with my editor at Putnam, whose name is Rachel Kahn. Rachel is the perfect example of what happens when you are a reader from the age of two and you know exactly what you want to do and you pay your dues early. And if there were any justice in this life, such driven, talented, intelligent people would not also be good looking. But there is not. And so Rachel is gorgeous. <laughs> and I must confess that I had inappropriate and unprofessional thoughts about my editor. <laughs> so when she took a job at another publisher, I recognized another opportunity. <laughs> And I asked her out on a date, and we've been married for four months. Thank you. Thanks a lot.